Hello friends, welcome to Dr. Saif Physiology Academy, DOPA for short. This is the place where we make the learning of physiology easy, exciting, and effective. Thank you for joining me. So today now we are going to be dealing with, like, let's take the final aspect of renal physiology, diuresis, diuretics, and nutrition. All right. So always remember that learning about how the body functions, which is what physiology is all about, and teach you vital health lessons, life lessons, and even management lessons. So let's get started. So diuresis, what is diuresis? Diuresis. It simply means excess urination. That's what it means, simply excess urination. When you take in, urinate a lot of water, urine with high volume of water. That's what it means, diuresis. Then diuretics. Diuretics are substances that stimulate excess urination. Okay? Diuresis, diuretics, then micturition. Micturition simply means urination. Okay? Why this one is excess? This is just the process of voiding urine. That means passing out urine. So that's what maturation is all about. So we've talked about how the body produces the process of urine formation. So what we want to discuss now is how does the body now take it out of the body? That's where the bladder comes into play. Okay, you see this thing here. This is the ureter. This is coming from the kidneys. This is one kidney. This is another kidney. The ureter comes like this and connects to the bladder. So the function of the bladder is just to store the urine. If the bladder was not here, that means as the urine is produced in tiny, tiny volumes, droplets, it will be escaping from the body. There's no control. So this bladder helps to store it till when there is now what is known as a micturition, micturition reflex. Micturition reflex means a reflex that initiates the emptying of the bladder. So that's what we're going to focus on when we're dealing with micturition. But let's start from diuresis. There are important things we need to learn from there. So in diuresis, there are three types of diuresis. One of them, let's use this. Number one, water diuresis. Number two, osmotic, osmotic diuresis. Three, you have pressure diuresis. What does this mean? You need to know about it because it will help you even in your clinical practice. So what does water diuresis mean? It means the excretion of excess free water urination of excess high volume of free when we talk about free water we're talking about the fact that the water there is lacking in a lot of solutes it's very dilute water so we're just excreting and what causes water diuresis when you take just imagine that i sit down now and we are doing water drinking competition or alcohol drinking competition i sit down with my friends and we are playing the game and oh if you fail it you will drink one cup of water so you keep drinking drinking what will happen you start before you know it you urinate after 15 minutes you go again 
So that is water diuresis. Okay? So what happens is that because of the amount of water you have taken in, it enters into the bloodstream and it dilutes the ECL. Remember in the last lecture, I think the last lecture eight, talked about the maintenance of ECF osmolarity. So addition of excess water dilutes it. That does what? It inhibits ADH production. So when ADH production is inhibited, water cannot be reabsorbed at the distal tubule. That's a late distal tubule and the collecting duct. So you excrete more dilute urine. So that's what happens. So that's water diuresis, urination of very dilute urine because of excess intake of either water or alcohol. In alcohol, 90 something percent is water. Okay? So osmotic diuresis. Osmosis from the word osmosis. What does osmosis mean? Osmosis means that there is a membrane separating two compartments. One compartment has a certain amount of solute. Let's say this is compartment one, compartment two. This compartment one has a high concentration of solute. This one has very little concentration of solute, which means that water to favor the movement of water into compartment one. So osmotic diuresis, it means that when the tubules, the nephrons, those, the renal tubule, when it contains a substance that is easily filtered, let's say this is the tubule, this is the glomerulus, okay? So this is the tubule and so on. So that substance is filtered freely into the tubule, but that substance, it is difficult for that substance to be reabsorbed. So that substance stays within the tubule and it's making the filtrate in that tubule to be highly concentrated, which now does what? It drags water. It drags water into, so it rather it prevents water from being reabsorbed. You know, water is reabsorbing all other parts of the body. So it prevents water from being reabsorbed and can even drag in some water. So that's what happens. But this plays role in cortical nephrons. Why? Because in juxta medullary nephrons that are just 15%, the high renal osmotic gradient is by far higher than any osmolarity the tubo can ever get to. So it doesn't really affect it. That's for the um, um, juxta medullary. So, but cortical nephrons are more in number, 85% of them, cortical nephrons. So, and um, the renal interstitium of cortical nephrons is just normal, it's not high. So, when you have this tubule having higher osmolarity, it prevents reabsorption of water, which now causes more water to be excreted in the urine. So you have more excretion of water plus that solute that is making that place concentrate. That's osmotic diuresis. All right, so what is pressure diuresis? This is how it happens. This pressure diuresis happens more as it relates to the juxtamedullary nephrons. Now, those juxtamedullary nephrons, you know that they have a high renal osmotic gradient, the interstitium there. So but what happens is that the blood supply of that juxtamedullary nephrons, that interstitium, that's it. The, the auto-regulation of blood pressure is not well developed there. 
What do we mean by that? Now, in normal cortical nephrons, the auto regulation of blood pressure is effective in this pressure range from 80 to 180. There's little change. Okay? There was little change in the blood pressure because the auto regulatory mechanism of the kidney itself is effective to buffer it, to reduce it, to cushion the effect. But in that interstitial, uh, um, interstitial, renal interstitial of juxtamillary nephron, the blood supply there is not effective in this auto regulatory mechanism. So when blood pressure increases to so say 150, 160, 180, it does what? It will lead to a washing out of that high gradient. So that high gradient there becomes dilute. And once you don't no longer have that high gradient, urine cannot be concentrated at that point. You know, the high gradient there is what enables the concentration of urine because it makes the reabsorption of water possible. Cool, but that high pressure washes out that high osmotic gradient. So the reabsorption of water by ADH is not there anymore. Okay, so you now excrete more water. So that's what pressure diuresis does. When you have high pressure, high blood pressure, you will excrete more water. So these are the three types of diuresis. Okay, so now let's enter the next one, diuretics. That means substances, some of them are drugs that stimulate excess urination. Diuretics, by the way, they are actually used in very important medical conditions, especially hypertension. You know why? Because when the blood volume is high, the blood pressure is high. When the blood volume is low, it reduces the blood pressure. So excess urination reduces blood volume. So it helps to reduce blood pressure. That's why it helps in controlling hypertension. It's a very important drug used in the management of hypertension, especially in Africans. Okay? It's also used in heart failure. You know, when there's heart failure, there's edema, accumulation of fluid. So you want to flush out that excess fluid. So you can also use diuretics. So pay close attention. All right? So now, Diuretics. The amazing thing about the diuretics is that the way they function is related to those reabsorption mechanisms, reabsorption mechanisms of the renal tubo. So the different types of diuretics, they play a role in the different segments. And most of them, interestingly, they are related to the absorption of sodium. Why are they related to the absorption of sodium? You remember that we said that wherever sodium goes, water goes. So if sodium is retained, water is retained. If sodium is lost, water is lost. So that's the secret. So I'm going to outline five different diuretics and three of them are related to the excretion of sodium. All right? So let's use this simple acronym. Coal. Okay, then you add T to it. Coal. So number one, you have what is called carbonic anhydrous inhibitors. That's the C. Then the O, you have osmotic diuretics. 
Okay, so don't confuse it with osmotic diuresis. It's osmotic diuresis, diuretics. Okay, so number three, the A. Aldosterone inhibitors. Okay, then the L. You have loop diuretics. It means they act at the loop of Henley. That's what I call loop diuretics. And number five, T, thiazide diuretics. Okay, so these are the five broad types of diuretics. That I used. Okay, so now let's start with this. How does this carbonic anhydrase inhibitors? How do they operate to that leads to diuresis? Now you remember that in the proximal tubule, okay, there is the reabsorption of bicarbonate. Okay, so when bicarbonate is reabsorbed, what happens is that the process of reabsorption of bicarbonate is indirect in the sense that it splits, it combines with H to give you carbonic acid, which then splits into CO2 and water. Then these ones now cross the membrane and recombine to give the bicarbonate. But what happens is that this reaction here is catalyzed by an enzyme called carbonic anhydrase. Okay? So carbonic and Hydrous is the enzyme that facilitates this reaction that leads to the reabsorption of bicarbonate. So when this enzyme is inhibited by this carbonic and hydrous inhibitors, bicarbonate will not be reabsorbed. And if bicarbonate is not reabsorbed, it increases the osmotic pressure of the tubule. When this osmotic pressure of the tubule is increased, water is, it is difficult for water to be reabsorbed. So it causes osmotic diuresis and excess, plenty of water is excreted. You have diarrhea. So that's how it operates. So it's similar to this osmotic diuretics. So in a way, you can also call it an osmotic diuretic, just that it's special in the sense that it inhibits an enzyme. But this one does not inhibit any enzyme. Osmotic diuretics are very direct. Okay, what happens to osmo with osmotic diuretics? Those are substances that, like we said when we we're explaining osmotic diuresis, that when you take them, they are filtered freely from the, in the nephrons that glomerular filtration, but they are not reabsorbed. They stay there in the renal tubule, causing a lot of osmotic pressure that prevents the reabsorption of water. So what happens? Water is not easily reabsorbed and excess water is excreted. A good example of this is called manitol. Manitol. Most times they use manitol clinically in the hospital to treat cerebral edema. That means accumulation of excess fluid in the brain. So when you give manitol, it reduces, it reduces it. It brings down that water, reduces the cerebral edema and the person is better. Okay. So manitol is a very common good osmotic diuretic. Right, so these last three, hmm, they are involved in 
control of sodium transport. They influence sodium transport. So, but the difference between them is the type of receptor or the type of channel, rather the type of channel that sodium uses in being transported. That's just the difference. And the segment of the nephron, that's what differentiates all of them. So let's start from aldosterone inhibitors. Like you already know, aldosterone acts at the distal tubal, the late distal tubal and the collecting dots. So what aldosterone does is that it helps in the creation of channels, sodium channels called INAC, epithelial sodium channels at that late distal tubal and collecting dot. So it now leads to the reabsorption of sodium and sodium goes, water goes, right? So what happens is that this is inhibited. You can also call them antagonists. But there are two types. They function slightly differently in the way they inhibit aldosterone, the action and the function of aldosterone. So one of those drugs is called spironolactone. Let's write it here with red. Okay, spironolactone. What this one does is that this one is aldosterone receptor antagonist or inhibitor in the sense that, you know, the process of how aldosterone acts is that aldosterone is secreted from the adrenal gland. Then it goes to the cell. Let's say this is the renal cells there. Okay. So it goes inside there, acts on it binds, first of all, it binds to a receptor, aldosterone receptor inside the cell. Then it now stimulates the creation of this channel. So these channels are now inserted from which sodium will be reabsorbed. Sodium will pass through it. So this spinolactone inhibits this receptor that aldosterone will come to bind to, to prevent the absorption of sodium. So sodium is retained in the tubal, water is retained in the tubal, so excess water is lost. So there's another type of aldosterone antagonist, it's called amyloride. Okay, this one acts differently. This amyloride directly inhibits this enac the epithelial sodium channel. So it doesn't start from inhibiting the recept aldosterone receptor. So aldosterone, quite all right, will go there, bind to its receptor, create a channel, then this one will go and scatter the channel. <laughs> it inhibits the channel from binding, from allowing sodium to pass. Okay, so that's what happens. So this, but they all have overall final effect of not allowing sodium to be reabsorbed. The sodium is retained in the tubal, water is also retained, excess water is passed. So that's how these drugs, they are used in medicine, those with hypertension, loop diuretics is the next one we are going to talk about. And they are very powerful, very powerful. So, from the name, it means that they act at the loop of Henley. Let's say this is the loop of Henley. They act at that loop of Henley. So what happens is that, remember that the loop of Henley has the thick ascending limb. And that thick ascending limb, want something like special about it is that it's, pumps a lot of solute into the interstitium. It allows the transport of sodium, okay? So the channel there, like we mentioned in the previous lecture, is the one 
sodium, one potassium, two chloride channel. That's the channel that is operational at the tick ascending link. So the loop diuretics, this is what they inhibit. They inhibit this channel. So when they inhibit this channel, sodium cannot pass and be reabsorbed from the tubo through those channel back into the interstitial fluid and into the blood. Okay? So that's what happens. It's very straightforward. So they are very powerful diuretic. So sodium is retained in the tubo, water is retained with it, and excess water is excreted. Okay? So finally, tyrosine diuretics. The same sodium influence. They influence sodium transport. The difference, like, is the point at which they influence. So in this tyrosine diuretic, where they inhibit sodium transport is in the early distal tubule. Aldosterone inhibitors, the late distal tubule and the collecting dots, they inhibit a NAC, a sodium channel. This one, they inhibit sodium chloride channel. That's the channel that is operational at the early. So that's what differentiates the tick ascending limb from the early part. They have a lot of similarities. The only difference is in the channel in which sodium is transported. The tick ascending limb uses this channel. The early distal tube uses this channel, sodium chloride channel. Very simple. Okay, so these tyrosine diuretics, they come here and inhibit this channel. Sodium is not transported and reabsorbed. It's retained. Water is retained with it. Excess water is transported. So an example of this, the name is called hydrochlorothiazide. Okay, so an example of the name of this loop diuretics is called frusenide. So you might have heard of it, of the names of this. So we have spinorolactone and amyloride for this, frusenide for this, hydrochlorothiazide for that. Then you have manitol. So these are the different types of diuretics all acting to excrete and remove excess water, all right? So after this break, we'll now go on to micturition to see what happens, how the body finally removes the urine out of the body. All right, welcome back. So we want to talk about this final aspect called micturition. It simply means urination or emptying of the bladder, voiding urine. Okay? So quickly, what happens is that this is the domain. Micturition is the domain of the urinary, urinary bladder. Okay, so what we just want to do is how does the bladder function? You know, we talked about that there's a nutrition reflex. So how does it happen that urine fills up in this bladder? What stimulates it to now? How does it know when to empty itself? If you look at this diagram very well, you will see that there are nerves that connect the bladder both to the spinal cord and to the brain. Okay? But first of all, let's, let's take a look at the bladder. The bladder itself, as big as it is, it's composed mainly of smooth muscle. And that smooth muscle is called the trusor. 
the trousseau muscle. Okay, that's what surrounds the bladder, the trousseau muscle. So the ureter enters into the bladder at this point here, this point here. So around this place where it enters, it's called the trigone. Okay, so anatomy will teach you better the anatomy of this. So the inner part of the bladder has some folds called rugae inside. Rugae. Rugae, okay? So the coven there has a lot of folds. But what we're interested in mainly is this part. This part is called the internal urethra sphincter. Okay? This part here is called the internal internal urethra sphincter. Why this this are muscles here? They are called external. You see where they are coming from? External. So they are called external urethral sphincter. Why this is where the urethra begins from. Okay? This ureter is urethra. Alright? There's a difference. The name, ureter, urethra. So what happens from the word sphincter? Sphincters, generally, their role is to control the movement of fluids especially liquids, okay? So that is a play very important role in the control of the passage of urine out of this bladder. So the next thing you ask yourself, the detrusome muscle, what does it do? So this detrusome muscle, hmm, what it does is that it contracts, it initiates this maturation. Then this other one relaxes the sphincter. So they act, they cooperate in the action. But first of all, let's look at these nerves that supply this. Okay? So they are the, the bladder, the micturation process. There are two different types of nerves that help to facilitate it. One is autonomic. Autonomic nerves, then two have somatic nerves. No somatic nerves are also skeletal, as they innervate skeletal muscles. Okay, they are under voluntary control. You can consciously control them. The contraction of those muscles. Why these autonomic nerves? When they supply muscles, they supply smooth muscles, you cannot control their contraction or relaxation. So, like we said, this autonomic nerves is divided into parasympathetic and sympathetic. You know, the autonomic nervous system. So, you have the parasympathetic of that autonomic nervous system, parasympa supply, then you have the sympathetic supply. So this one is by what is known as the pelvic nerves. Okay, the pelvic nerves supply this detrusor muscle and also the internal urethral sphincter, okay? So that's what happens. Then the sympathetic is supplied through the hypogastric hypogastric 
hypogastric nerves. Then this last one, the somatic nerves, supplied by the pudendal nerve. This one here, this external urethral sphincter is supplied by this pudendal nerve. So the function is to close that place so that urine cannot pass until you allow it to pass. No, it's under conscious effort. All right, skeletal, voluntary, conscious effort. So what happens is that what is now the function of this pelvic nerves parasympathetic? They relax, I mean, they contract, they contract this detrusor muscle. So this one leads to contraction of urinary bladder. And at the same time, it leads to relaxation, relaxation of internal sphincter. So don't get confused. They are acting in complementary manner. So it's called the nerve of emptying because when the bladder contracts, the internal urine transfer will relax to give way so that urine can pass. So it's helping the bladder contract through the detrusor muscle and it's now helping the urethral sphincter to relax. So it's called the nerve of emptying, the parasympathetic nerve, the pelvic nerves. All right? So that's what they do. Then this sympathetic, of course, does the opposite. It helps the detrusor muscle to relax while it now helps to contract this internal sphincter. Okay? So it's called the nerve of feeling. That means it allows the feeling of the bladder to relax it so that bladder can feel. And when the bladder is feeling, so that urine will not be escaping, it contracts the internal urethral sphincter. So they do opposite function, okay? So just, it's logical. Feeling, it prevents leakage by contracting now. Why that other one is contracting, emptying, and it's relaxing the internal sphincter? So that's what happens. This one is other voluntary control. You can voluntarily contract it by yourself. So we've talked about this different. So now the micturition reflex. How does it happen? Micturition reflex. It is very straightforward. Now, this is what happens. When the bladder is filling with urine from the kidneys, what happens is that the bladder is relaxed. So at the urine volume of 200 to 300, it has filled up to 300 mils. Yet, the pressure in the bladder still remains almost the same. There is little or no change. So because there's little or no change, 200 to 300, nothing happens. It doesn't stimulate anything. Because this material reflex is stimulated by pressure in the bladder. It's called intravesical pressure as the pressure within the bladder so urine is entering at this level it doesn't change the pressure within the bladder but what happens at urine volume of about 300 to 400 mils the pressure in the bladder begins to increase rapidly and what does that do that pressure in the bladder 
stimulates stretch receptors. Stretch receptors are known as mechanoreceptors. Okay? So there are mechanoreceptors in the wall of the bladder. So when the pressure is now increasing in the bladder, it stretches and activates those receptors. Those receptors, if you see this arrow here like this, that means it's sensing the stretch and it's reporting it to the spinal cord. So the spinal cord is activated. But, ah, so that activation is the reflex, the activation reflex. Ah, that's it's telling it now that the bladder is getting almost full, it's full, it needs to be emptied. So that's what happens. So it now comes through this efferent. This is the afferent. Okay, afferent parasympathetic. Then this is now the efferent branch. This is the efferent. So it's the efferent that now leads to the contraction of the bladder. And it happens in a very special way. It's called a reflex in the sense that when this comes now to contract the bladder, as the bladder contracts, the pressure now increases even further, which now sends more impulse to the spinal cord that will now send even a stronger contraction. So it's now like a positive feedback cycle that continues, continues. We call it that it is self regenerating. So once it starts, it continues to increase. It will not stop till all the urine in the bladder is emptied. So it contracts this one, it relaxes the internal sphincter, and the urine is voided. But this is what happens also. This one, external sphincter, it goes down to the brain, to the cerebral cortex where there is awareness, there's consciousness. That means you can control it. So even if it's full, you can decide to, through conscious effort, contract and lock it up. <laughs> okay? So the bladder is full and you are in a bus traveling. The bladder is full. You can't urinate in the bus now. So you hold it, hold it, keep holding it. What you are doing there, you are contracting this external urethral transmitter. So bladder, there's pressure. One thing to this material reflex has been activated, but you are tightening it so it doesn't escape. So you are now in a convenient place. You now consciously relax this. <laughs> and the urine comes out. So you see how it plays a very wonderful role. So without this external sphincter, Hmm? Without this conscious distinct, once it gets to this level, your ring will just start and empty itself to the end without control. So if you know little children, because this pathway has not been fully developed, the conscious pathway has not been developed very well. That's why you see a lot of children, that's what they call enuresis. It means bed wetting as children are sleeping and brrr, they urinate on themselves. When they are awake, it doesn't happen. They consciously, when they are sleeping, once this metrotron reflex is activated, it doesn't awaken them. You no, know, an adult, once it travels to this place, it awakens you. wake up and go and urinate. But this one, while they are still sleeping, it will activate that reflex and the bladder will contract and everything is voided. Okay, so that's what happens in neurosis without the conscious control. So that is called automatic bladder. That means the bladder that just controls itself. It gets full and it knows that, oh, it's full and it empties itself while you are still sleeping. Automatic bladder. So people who have spinal cord injuries, that there's a what I call a transsection here. They still can still urinate, but it's just that it does not, they cannot control their urination. 
once it gets to this level, ah, your rain will come. So it's automatic bladder. So this is the process, how the body operates to control the urination. Okay? So the urine has been produced in the kidney through the nephrons, through all those plenty processes we discussed one by one. Now the bladder now does the final job of excreting the waste, the urine, at a convenient time. All right? So you can get further information from your renal physiology test which I wrote. I've written a book on renal physiology and some other aspects of physiology. So check the description box. You'll see the link there. You can download it, take it to a card book, the soft copy, just for a token to get a better grasp of these things. And also visit our website, www.dalecrestconsult.com.ng. You see the amazing things we are doing to make the learning of physiology easy, exciting, and effective. So visit us and you'll be amazed at so many things so I can take advantage of other things we are doing to push this message forward. Thank you.